Today, I'm speaking with Dr. Morag Kersel. Dr. Kersel is a field archaeologist who studies ancient Israel, Jordan, and Palestine, from the Neolithic to the Bronze Age. She's also an expert in many modern issues plaguing the world of archaeology, such as looting, the antiquities market, and the role of cultural heritage laws in protecting archaeological landscapes. We discuss her research on some of these impacts to Near Eastern antiquities and the many paths an artifact can take from the ground to a museum, a shopfront, or a private collection. My name is Sebastian Weatherby, and this is The Tell. Well, uh, Dr. Kersel, thanks for taking the time to talk with me. Really appreciate it. It's my pleasure, Sebastian. Thanks for the invite. What do archaeologists mean when they say that their work is destructive? First of all, I'm not sure you would get many archaeologists to say that their work is destructive. That in in and of itself is a pretty contentious moment. Even there have been some pushback against the use of the term extractive. So the, yeah. I think what you're asking is, though, how is it non-renewable? Mm-hmm. So an archaeologist yeah. goes in, digs a site, mm-hmm. and we can never put it back in its original form. Right? Mm-hmm. We, can't put the, we can put dirt back, but we can't put it back in the stratigraphic yeah. layers. You can never rearrange the, it. That's right, yeah. with the artifacts. Yeah. And so um, once you dig it, that's it. Yeah. So, I mean, I wouldn't term it as destructive because I would hope that most, and certainly most archaeologists are very methodical in the way they record everything that they've removed. And, mm-hmm. um, yeah, with so, this very concern in mind, yeah. Right, exactly. And so it's really about it um, once things, it's non-renewable. And so once things have been removed, uh, you have to publish it or move on, but you can't put it back. Before talking more about these modern ethical issues in archaeology that you deal with, um, how did you get your start in the discipline? That's a good question. Uh, (laughs) I have wanted to be an archaeologist since I was in grade five. I'm from a tiny town in southern Ontario, and we did a school trip to the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto. Yeah. And it was there I discovered, you know, Greece and Rome and Egypt, and um, I became obsessed with things like that. And so it never really left me. I've done a lot of things here and there, but I've always um, come back to archaeology, and I'm a real field archaeologist. Mm -hmm. Um, I really like being in the field. I like, uh, especially like survey more than excavation, so I like pedestrian survey, and now I've been doing a lot of aerial survey and remote sensing with my colleague Chad Hill from the University of Pennsylvania. And so um, I like survey a lot. I also realized that I am anthropological in my approach because I also like talking Mm -hmm. to people about their interactions with the landscapes in which we work or the objects that we're finding. And you work mainly in Jordan, right? Uh, Yes. So I would say I work mostly in Jordan, Israel, and Palestine. Well, first of all, I guess, what, what periods do you study? But then what, what was the entry point for you from sort of just being, say, a, a, an archaeologist focused on, say, di- diachronic questions of what's happening in this time period or to this village or to this site to, to then thinking about these broader industry-level issues? So I am someone who works in the Neolithic, Calcolithic, Early Bronze Age, mm-hmm. um, but I'm not a material culture specialist, so I mm-hmm. don't know the pottery or the flint or the paleobotany. Mm-hmm. Um, I w- have most often been an architectural drafts person, so drawing all the oh, architecture. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, not like hand drawing, because uh, I'm that old, and so it's all <laughs> old school. Um, but I have also just been a digger, and so when I finished my undergraduate, I went to work in with a professor in Greece, and mm-hmm. I worked in Crete and did a pedestrian survey of the White Mountains in the Spakia area. And then I left there and went to Israel and worked on a Calcolithic site, um, Shikmim. It's getting ready to be published, and it was just a really interesting site. Mm -hmm. And so it really made me think about working in Israel. And so I just finished my undergraduate, and then I applied to do a master's degree at the University of Toronto Mm -hmm. in um, Near and Middle Eastern, their Near and Middle Eastern Center. And um, I didn't really know what I wanted to study, and I uh, worked with... um, Professor Jack Holliday, who was an Iron Age specialist, and he said, you know, you should look at these pillar-based figurines from the Iron II period, which was something he was interested, maybe not something I was that interested in. Yeah. (laughs) 
He's like, you know, we don't really know if they come from Jerusalem or if they come from the north, and there are two mm-hmm. different kinds, these mold-made heads and these pinched face. Hmm. Are they regional? What do we know? Yeah. So I started looking into them, and what I found was most of them are in private collections. So we actually have no idea where they come from. Hmm. So even to do a regional, like a really in-depth regional study of the whole entire corpus that's out there um, would be difficult because a lot of them are private collections and they're decontextualized. They were purchased in the market and we don't know what site they come from. Yeah, yeah. And so it was that in that moment where I thought, wow, how much else don't we know because things are from the market? Yeah. And that's how I got into looking at I don't want to say questions of ethics, but just a different kind of archaeology that impacts us. Mm -hmm. Um, And I've also been sort of always interested in law. And so I was really interested in figuring out how law affects the average archaeologist, like national ownership laws or international conventions. Mm -hmm. And so that all played part and parcel into studying the movement of antiquities, figuring out what laws help or hinder the movement. How do issues around looting and antiquities dealing in uh, the places that you work, Jordan, Israel, uh, how do they compare with with elsewhere, places like South America, Central America? I mean, I can tell you about the research I've done, but there are yeah. other people, you know, who've also tracked other corpuses mm-hmm. of material um, in Central and South America, but also in um, Southeast Asia. And so I'm really looking at that specific area in the Levant. Yeah. Um, and it's not like anywhere else because people who want artifacts from there want them because they're somehow related to the Bible. And you don't get that right, anywhere right. else. And so the demand for a moche pot from forever is different than the demand for a widow's mite coin from the Holy Land or an early Bronze Age pot. Right. So I always have to preface it by saying that because mm-hmm. my corpus, you probably can't use it as a direct comparanda to other areas of the world. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing is in Israel, it's legal to buy and sell antiquities. So I'm not here to stop the trade if they've decided that it should be legal, whether or not, you know, the majority, if you polled Israelis today, uh, whether the majority of them would say we should have a trade or we shouldn't have a trade, they do. And every year, thousands of people buy stuff in that market. And those are the people that I'm interested in talking to, what they're buying, you know, why they're buying it and what they do with it when they bring it home. You know, how it looks from the ground to the consumer, um, I I don't want to mislead anyone thinking that I speak to millions of looters because I absolutely (laughs) don't. Um, But I have spoken to a few and um, the people that I've spoken to are looting things that they know they can sell to a middle person. So in Jordan, for example, looters that we spoke to told us that black cars from Amman or uh, Karak, which is the closest city to the sites we work at, will come to the site and pick up the pots that they're looting and they'll Mm -hmm. pay them between four and seven dollars and then those people will drive those pots to Amman it's illegal in Jordan to buy and sell antiquities but Mm -hmm. it used to be legal um, pre-1976 and so there are still networks in place and a lot of the movement of materials goes in the same circles as the movement of guns and Uh drugs and people and so there are really well established networks yeah So the folks in Amman will, with their contacts on the other side of the Jordan River in Israel-Palestine, will somehow get things across the border. And then they will make their way into the Israeli market where they're laundered through this process. And then they're legally available for sale. And so when you and I enter a licensed shop, and there are about 60 licensed shops right now in Israel, Mm We have no idea that what we're buying might have been looted yesterday because it right, already right. looks legal. At least like in the case of Israel, what do you mean when you say that that antiquities dealing is legal? Is it, how is that circumscribed? Like, like I assume I still can't go up to a random tell in Israel no. and just start digging. No. So the, it's illegal to... Yes, you have to have permission from the relevant authorities to do any kind of excavation, and you shouldn't really even pick up a shirt that you find at any site you visit. Yeah, yeah. That's also illegal. Mm-hmm. Um, but under the 1978 law in Israel, there is a provision to sell antiquities. Mm-hmm. 
under that provision, if you are a licensed dealer, you would apply to the Israel Antiquities Authority for the privilege of selling, and you'd pay them $1,000. And in order to get your license, you need to provide an inventory of everything that's in your shop. So you give yeah. everything a number, number one through 1,500 or whatever, how many things you have in your shop. Yeah. So then if you or I go into the shop as a tourist, because we see that their license to sell is prominently displayed, so they're authorized by the state to sell antiquities, Mm -hmm. the only way that antiquities should be sold in that shop is if they predate 1978 and they were Mm -hmm. grandfathered in. If they were legacy collections, like you're the nephew of Moshe Diane, who was a big collector of antiquities, but you're not interested in them. So you can sell them on right? Yeah, yeah. to one of the licensed dealers. Or if you're a museum and you have thousands and thousands of Middle Bronze Age pots, you can deaccession them and sell them to a dealer. Oh, really? Okay. That doesn't happen very often, but, but you, can, you could do that. Huh. So that's the only way new material should be entering the market. So if we yeah. are economists and we do the math, the market should be drying up. If people are yeah. buying pots, buying things year after year after year, there should be a drying up. But I imagine there's a spoiler There coming. is. And so <laughs> the way it works is because you have submitted your inventory to the Israel Antiquities Authority, till 2016, it could be a handwritten ledger that said, you know, with a description like, Buff colored pot number 147. Yeah. From the early Bronze Age. So I go into the shop and I buy that pot. The loophole in the law is that I, as the buyer, should ask for the export license. Hmm. If I don't ask the dealer for the export license, he doesn't have to call the Israel Antiquities Authority and get them to issue it, and they cross off number 147. Ah, so you can so sell you the could same re- number. Reuse over and over. that number yeah. for another buff colored pot in your collection that was looted yesterday from my site on the Dead Sea Plain. Yeah, yeah. And that's how, that's one way recently looted material is entering that market. And, well, I guess it gets to one of these licensed dealers and then a wealthy tourist buys it and it, it goes to Not a, even a wealthy collection tourist. overseas. Your, your aunt, my mom, yeah, pays yeah. 50 bucks for an oil lamp or what, $15. It's not, <laughs> it's, it, you know, it's not even that much money we're talking about. Yeah. 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 But the bulk of the sales are not to wealthy individuals. They're to the average tourist. But that said, between 2009 and 2014, and I've been doing this work since 2002 when I started my PhD, mm-hmm. there was something weird going on in the market, and I just didn't know what it was. You know, new material was entering. Like, there was a lot of Mesopotamian material, a lot of textual material, and I just couldn't figure out what was going on. And um, relationships I'd cultivated with dealers, and over the years, no one really wanted to talk to me. Hmm. Buyers didn't really want to talk to me. And it was only a few years later when I was having a conversation with Professor Candida Moss that I realized that she and her colleague Joel Baden had done an interview with Steve Green of the Hobby Lobby Museum of the Bible fame. Yeah. He bought over 40,000 artifacts in that market in that period. He was moving the market. And I had no idea. Wow, as an individual. And I had no idea. I've never seen that before, and I've never seen it since. But just in that small period, there was a complete change in the market that I couldn't wow. explain until I connected that dot later on. Can we? Can, could you introduce uh, to listeners what the curation crisis is? Because to me, this always seems to loom over these other issues of, of sort of the ethics of where an artifact belongs, where it ought to go. Right. So we archaeologists... What do we love to do? We love to dig, right? Nobody wants to spend their summer sitting at home in front of their computer typing up the notes of season of digging, right? Everybody wants yeah. to be in the field year after year and, after year. And I know it's changing, but like I've been told, like when I was an undergrad and starting to think about getting a master's degree and, and wondering about maybe I should get a PhD down the line, I'd have conversations with people where they said, if you really want to get a professorship eventually or something like that, you have to run your own excavation or come up with your own project. You need to, you could make it into a, a nonprofit. You could get grants for it. You could do all this stuff. You could be the director, the project director. You don't just want to take some other professor's collection and do a little bit of stuff on it. 
Yeah, and that's the ethos we need to change Mm because that's the issue, right? Um, And this is also reinforced by the funding agencies. So National Science Foundation, they don't want to fund you sitting at home writing up your (laughs) results either. They want to see results of some fascinating thing you did in the field that summer. Yeah, or some like statistical analysis using metadata, nothing like that. Nothing like that, right? (laughs) So because this is this is our, you know, is as. Professor John Cherry of Brown University has said this is our reason for living, right, is excavation Mm -hmm. and whether or not, you know, questioning in a paper he wrote on whether or not we should be, you know, just living for excavation. We have now run into an issue where we've excavated a lot of stuff. We, as a discipline, have done a really poor job of publishing it and keeping up with publishing it. And now we don't know where to put it all. Yeah. And that's true all over the world, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so Mm -hmm. I work in Jordan they have storage facilities. When you finish your season, you're supposed to leave your materials with there, or sometimes you can get permission to bring them back to your institution to study them, but eventually they'll go back there. But mm-hmm. they're running out of space. Everybody's running out of space. Yeah. yeah. So that is the curation crisis, right? Yeah. It's like we're running out of space. We sometimes are more successful than others of keeping track of everything. So you excavated mm-hmm. something in 1996. Can we find it now in the storeroom? <laughs> I don't know. It's a question, yeah, yeah. right? Because despite the best efforts of all of these institutions, both academic and governmental, it's hard to keep track of everything. Right, and, and, and say the, the collections manager um, of a given branch of the Smithsonian, they might they might be managing millions of individual objects indeed that's right thousands and thousands of cabinets and all of that yeah they can be as diligent and and conscientious about it as they as they can be but that's not enough resources or manpower well and uh, you know as you and i both know technology is also changing on how you Mm -hmm. record these things and put them into storage so the department of antiquities in jordan and the american center of research which is the american center in amman have both just gotten a collaborative grant to do a national database of Mm -hmm. the collections in jordan yeah that's a tall order (laughs) that's huge i mean that's going to be someone's life's work right yeah Keeping up with the technology to actually enter into the database all of these things. Yeah. And then figuring yeah. out what shelf they go on. And then, you know, giving access to researchers on down the line. And there seems to me to be kind of a an immediate, almost moral repercussion. Like, if you have, for, for sake of argument, um, I don't remember the number, but I know the Smithsonian has in the tens of millions of, of items. And... It's only a tiny, tiny fraction of the of those items will ever go on display, or probably ever be looked at by a visiting researcher. Mm-hmm. But but um, if sort of the <laughs> the Indiana Jones refrain of "it belongs of a mu- in a museum," if that's true, it's because museums preserve artifacts so that the public can learn about them, or so they're available to researchers. Right, and I think that's why people have become more creative in figure, trying to figure out how to deal with the storage crisis. One of the projects that I've been working on with Meredith Chesson of the University of Notre Dame and Chad Hill of the University of Pennsylvania is mm-hmm. follow the pots. Because Jordan and the American Schools of Overseas Research, ASOR, recognized in the 70s that excavations that had taken place in the 1960s by Paul Lapp at the site of Baba Dra mm-hmm. had produced thousands of pots. And unfortunately, uh, Dr. Lapp passed away unexpectedly in a swimming accident in 1970, mm-hmm. which left his excavation materials and legacy publications to his wife, Nancy Lapp. Mm-hmm. So Nancy, in collaboration with colleagues from the Department of Antiquities and under the auspices of ASOR, thought about this scheme. Like, we have all these things in storage and mm-hmm. no one can access them. Yeah. Why don't we sell tomb groups, keep them all together, and sell each individual tomb group to educational institutions who could use them for teaching and research? So that's what they did. In 1978, they sold 24 tomb groups. Wow. And so, and and two small seminaries so that, you know, someone in the Midwest in Dubuque could access early Bronze Age pots from Jordan, right? 
And the impetus for the Department of Antiquities, and we have great archival documentation of this, was that these artifacts could act like ambassadors. Yeah, so you yeah. as an undergraduate at some seminary in the Midwest would see this and think, wow, this is so cool, I really need to go to Jordan. And you yeah. might, yeah. right? Generally, it's really an anathema. And, it, and under the Society for American Archaeology principles, their number mm -hmm. three principle is no commercialization and the sale of pots would be a commercialization. Right. Um, people don't like to talk about that. But one of the other, or they don't want to look at this as a solution to things in storage. But yeah. One of the yeah. other arguments that they make is, okay, so let's say we sell materials. What if Science changes, and you and I both know that over the last 10 to 15 years, science has changed. So now we can yeah. do all kinds of different residue analysis that we couldn't do before. Mm -hmm. So what if we wanted to revisit those pots and figure out exactly what was stored in them? How would we know where they were? So the Follow the Pots project set out to, to track them to figure out if those same 24 tomb groups were in the same place. So we sold them in 1978. Yeah, It's almost what? 50 years later, are they still in the same place? Mm -hmm. And all. today, I have tracked almost all of them to exactly the same place, or... And when you say almost all, you're, are you talking about the individual? Of the 24 tomb groups, yeah. all of them are in the same place, except one, which was moved from Claremont Colleges to Wilmette, where um, it was going to be used and housed. Uh -huh. Uh, in a bit. So we know exactly where they all are. So that can't yeah. be an argument anymore. You can absolutely... So, so far it has done what it intended yes, to do. absolutely. Yeah. And you can absolutely keep track of them and you can know where they are and we could all go back and study them tomorrow and figure out what was stored in those storage jars that were buried with people. And an another kind of interesting option, I guess, that I'd actually never heard of before is uh, catch and release archaeology. So what is that? Yeah, so this is something that goes on in lots of places. And if you've ever worked at it, but it's rarely called catch and release, I will just say. Mm -hmm. I don't think people like that <laughs> term either. Um, I'm fine with it because I think it says exactly what it does. Um, if you've ever worked at a big tell site in Israel or Jordan or Palestine, where you find the, the major corpus you find are pottery sherds. Mm -hmm. And so you dig in the morning and in the afternoon, you might have pottery reading where the expert comes along and goes through all of the diagnostics. Yeah, which are sorting the, them. And, and sorting them and looking for and, paint yeah. and rims and, you know, whatever uh, sherd that might tell you what kind of pot it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they get separated out and those sherds that are diagnostic get put in bags for later study. All of the other body shirts and the things that we can't really find out that much information from mm -hmm. get dumped back at the site. And that's what catch the stuff we're saving and the release is the stuff putting yeah, back at the site. Yeah. So we still know approximately where it is. Yes. In theory, it could. You could access those shirts if you needed to yeah. in the future. Yeah. And ultimately, that's what I think that would put to rest a lot of questions that go along with catch and release. Yeah, the, the being able to reaccess them and, and really be able to associate them with their original recorded provenience, I guess, would... Well, and that's um, where the notes come in, right? So yeah, then you would yeah. have to, and this is where we should be incentivizing people to publish. Because it's yeah. not enough that the person in the field separated out the diagnostics It's going to take them back and study them. We need to know the context from which they came. Yeah. Right? We yeah. need to know that they're from the kitchen or they're from this room or they're from the field or whatever. Yeah. We need to know that. And we only can know that is if, if people publish the results, whether online, in a database, in an open source context, or in a you know, huge monograph. Mm -hmm. But we need to have the notes that accompany the actual excavation. Yeah, yeah. And Which is our greatest failing as a dis discipline, I would say. Yeah, it's something that more and more I'm always shocked by is how much information is kind of sitting in gray literature and field notes and... Uh, um, for those who don't know gray literature, I guess I'm referring to things like, say, a, a government fieldwork report or a cultural resource management report or uh, a report to a, um, a, a funding grant, agency. a funding organization. But even those are more accessible than someone's field notes yeah, who worked yeah. in the field for and 60 now it's just years sitting in and one then notebook passed on. In a drawer. Right? Yeah. 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 Um, 
yeah, written in <laughs> handwriting nobody else can read. But I think also people listening will want, it would be good for them to think about too the way that, uh, like you said earlier, technology also moves, methods methods move. Um, like for for example, um, uh, for my, my thesis, I uh, studied an Ice Age campsite in Colorado and I was looking at the bone assemblage of the site. One of the methods that I was using is called a zooarchaeology by mass spectrometry, which is essentially uh, a way of taking like a tiny unidentifiable chunk of bone and being able to tell what species or what genus it is. And you can use that to answer questions if you wanted to know about what people are hunting, whether they played a role in the extinction of some animal, whether if you were studying it in the Near East, you could use it to help distinguish, say, like sheep from goat, or you could use it to figure out what people were making bone tools out of. There's all sorts of applications, but 15 years ago, 15 years ago, you couldn't do that. And so all of that, all those tiny little pieces of bone confetti that you can't identify, that's just trash. That seems to be one of the the most sort of um, worrying parts to me is that we don't know what we could know in 30 years. It's true. Uh, I mean, if you just look at uh, the changes in remote sensing. Mm-hmm. I mean, do we wonder 20 years from now, will we even need to excavate? Because remote sensing has gotten so good, subsurface yeah. study, yeah. Yeah. that maybe we'll never have to excavate again because we can see what you know structures are below the surface in 3D rendering, yeah. so we can <laughs> actually reconstruct what was there. Yeah. I mean, I'm not suggesting we will never do archaeology again because there are lots of other questions. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. we may do less invasive archaeology, and we may do less of it excavation-wise because we know what's below the surface from a you know, revolution in, or a change in our abilities to do um, geophysical subsurface soundings. Yeah. I guess I also wanted to ask a little about remote sensing, about the project of tracking looting, how one can go about that beyond sort of on the ground. Like if you're in Israel and you're talking to, talking to people who've purchased antiquities or who are selling antiquities, how, how do you get beyond that to be able to get a kind of a broader sense of what's happening in the landscape? Uh, so that's an excellent question. And actually, you know, the project is pretty... Um multi-pronged in that, okay, I, and this is archaeology in a nutshell, it's one big group project, right? Yeah. Like, I don't work alone. Yeah. Yeah. I bring the... Everybody is a specialist. and <laughs> uh, Right, and everybody has to work together because, yeah. Yeah. yes. Nobody can learn it all. Right. Um, so I bring, you know, ethnography and walking on the landscape and, yeah. you know, yeah. that kind of aspect. But Chad is who was a remote plane enthusiast since he was five has been flying drones and you know is a amazing amazing whiz in gis and reconstructing and remote sensing and um all just all kinds of things and so one season chad and i decided in order to figure out what was happening on the ground, not just by talking to people, but from the air. Mm -hmm. We worked with colleagues from the Department of Antiquities in Jordan, and we did three seasons of drone flyovers to monitor change over time at a looted site. Because if you look at the site from Google Earth or from satellite imagery, you would look at it and think, wow, there must be nothing left to loot. And that's really what we set out to find. Are, is there, are there still yeah, Are they coming left? back? Yeah. Is more stuff getting dug and up? And there absolutely is still stuff. There are still graves, intact tombs. There are, there are still mm-hmm. people interacting with the site. So that was one element. And then it's from that where we know people are still re- in, interacting with the site negatively. Mm-hmm. Um, that's when we try to track the looters and then figure out how you know those holes were made, why they were made, and what happened to the stuff that was taken from them. I had another question that also was. Th- th- it's a little bit. <laughs> it's a little bit more sort of. Um, uh, Are you going to ask me, as many of the people I meet in the field ask me, what's the difference between a looter and an archaeologist? Because both come in, they dig, and they take stuff away, and they don't tell us what they're doing, and we never see the results of the well, research. Well, I would like to actually, yeah, I'd like to hear <laughs> that. Because I get answer. asked about that all the time. <laughs> yeah, do I tell. don't have an answer. No, I don't have an answer, because that's the problem, right? Yeah, Is yeah. that we, as a discipline, don't do a good enough job of letting local uh, inhabitants know what we're doing. Yeah. Right? Because they yeah. absolutely do not believe that we come, we fly thousands of miles and spend a lot of money to dig up broken sherds and bits of flint. They don't believe it. You must be a treasure hunter. 
We're right. finding gold, and we are not telling them <laughs> right. where it is. Right. That's yeah. absolutely, and that's true everywhere in the world, right? Yeah. Everyone thinks archaeologists are looking for gold. And mm-hmm. it's not that we aren't, and it's not that we don't find gold sometimes. But for the most part, of course, those aren't our research questions looking yeah. for gold. But that's, what every, that's the prevailing perception. And things like Indiana yeah. Jones don't really help, right? Because it's all about not. goody hunt. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the kind of pie-in-the-sky question I was going to ask earlier is... Oh, sorry to interrupt. <laughs> no worries. So probably a little bit stupid, but it was something no I was... No stupid questions. This is what I say to my students. Just <laughs> questions. Just questions. It, it's one that I was, uh, I was kind of tossing and turning over uh, last night thinking about. It's, uh, I, I did an internship several years ago for the Smithsonian, a collections management internship, and I was kind of thinking about the endless rows of shelves in one of their giant mega pods on like room or like the fourth floor and like the hundredth row opening uh, cabinets that had in some cases probably not been checked for a decade or longer writing down what was inside because they weren't sure what was inside in every case seeing things in conditions that they shouldn't be in going back to this this problem of the curation crisis of the glut of artifacts that are overflowing out of out of institutions and i i was having <laughs> Thoughts about the impermanence of any civilization, including our own. And so when I dig up a site, destroying it, how long will that information really outlast me? Can I, not, can I be sure that I'm not, uh, I'm not condemning some future society to never being able to have a memory the way that we do? The question is, what do you mean outlast, right? Like, yeah. mm-hmm. okay, because objects are impermanent, and so mm-hmm. maybe they're not meant to last forever. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. And as we've just been talking about, conservation has changed dramatically. And so, you know, the poisonous whatever they used to treat things 50 years ago in the museum world is not what we would do today. And now yeah, they're having yeah. to grapple with, like, how do we get rid of this poisonous stuff that we used that was state of the art at the time? Yeah. But um, I. You know, that's not something that I would worry about mm-hmm. because the nature of archaeology is that uh, there are always going to be remains, right? Mm-hmm. Remains of people, remains of animals, remains of civilizations, remains of um, nomads, remains of everything. And mm-hmm. so it will just be another type of interpretation for people to take on in the future. While we said that archaeology is non renewable, it's that individual sites are non renewable, but archaeology is infinite. Right? Yeah, because wherever things, we're always depositing. We are it, always yeah. leaving garbage, <laughs> which is basically what we're always digging up, right? Yeah. And so we are always leaving remnants of our lives. And so someone in the future may find it interesting and may not. When you're on the field and sorry, when you're in the field and you're you're doing this ethnographic work, how do the people you talk to feel about these sorts of big questions? The weightiness or not of of, of antiquities and, and history? Well, for a lot of them, it's a business, right? It's their mm-hmm. model. It's what they make their money doing. And so it's not, they're not agonizing over the ethical dimensions of it. And for the average person in the market buying in Jerusalem. It's probably just a cool It's item. legal. And yeah. so there's no like thinking untoward about anything they're doing. They've mm-hmm. gone into a shop where it's legal. Okay, maybe they knew or didn't know to ask for the export license, but they have nothing, you know, they don't see it. It's it's state sanctioned, so they don't have any issue with it at all. Um, mostly people don't really want to tell me how much they pay for things. And so I find that that's the moment where, you know, it's sort of awkward. I, 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 stopped ask, I stopped asking years ago because it became so awkward. Like, people don't want to tell you how much they paid for that pot. That's fine, because I did want to include that as part of the final, you know, tally of, like, how much looting one grave in Jordan, how much does that right. generate what is the sort of in the end, right? End result, um, yeah. But it's 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 very hard to know because people don't want to tell you, and that's mm-hmm. fine. Um, I fully respect that, but you know they don't have any moral dilemma with it. I don't know about folks like Michael Steinhardt or Shlomo Musayef, these big collectors who Musayef is famous for saying in his collection there must be fakes statistically as so much stuff, or he passed away recently, he had um, so much stuff that there have to be fakes in there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, for people outlaying that kind of money like Steve Green to buy 16 fake Dead Sea Scrolls, he probably paid millions of dollars. Like, yeah, you and I wouldn't even buy a car if we didn't get the, you know, the car facts. The we don't, you know, we need to know that we're buying the real thing that is not <laughs> fake, but also that it wasn't stolen yesterday. What is the mania that drives them to not ask those questions? 
I suppose it, it, it's probably very, very conditional on where you're studying and, and the period and yeah. And I've really been thinking about it a lot and I'm looking at these um, Neolithic masks and there are only 18 mm -hmm. of them known in the world mm -hmm. and nine of them were in Michael Steinhardt's collection which he recently had to forfeit and they're being repatriated to Israel. So what kind of capital, like how does he accrue esteem or greatness by buying a mask or right. owning a mask? Right, what is the status and associated? What does, yeah, and, and what does the museum get out of displaying a mask and what does the collector or the dealer get out of selling a mask okay yeah. for him you and i can probably think the economic capital that makes the most sense right mm -hmm. same for the looter but for these other folks like the um, academics studying them the archaeologists yeah, digging yeah. them up that yeah so thinking about the social capital yeah that's something i think about too though is this is the way that in a sense i'm kind of also participating in a very similar yeah a similar kind of self-interest i'm not I'm not directly going and looting items and selling them and getting money, but mm -hmm. I still get to have a job that I feel proud about, that I am like happy to tell people that I do, that that brings me some amount of, of sort of esteem or social capital. And and so it's not like I'm I'm an unbiased actor in this. I'm, right. We're, I mean, we're all complicit. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I've made a whole career on it. Th th there's like always an imp imperfection it seems to me in the the process of archaeology and and like if you excavate you could have always waited 10 years and done the excavation with better technology and research methods but those people 10 years from now also could have waited <laughs> you know it, it seems almost like there's an infinite regress kind of situation i don't know what to think at that point I well it's like i confused. said at the beginning there'll be no answers today it's yeah. just a lot <laughs> of like open-ended questions or thoughts about you know how this practice goes forward going forward what are you researching around these topics? So I recently, uh, it came to <laughs> just, um, I didn't just wake up one day, but it, I realized like I have been tracking the movement of antiquities through the Israeli marketplace for 20 years. So I started my PhD in 2022. So um, I have interviewed hundreds of people. Mm -hmm. So I have to stop talking to people about what they're buying in the market. As much as I love it because I love talking to people, I yeah. absolutely have to stop talking to the average person about what they're buying because I have a lot of data. Yeah. And so I'm yeah. working on publishing that. Yeah, it's time to actually digest that data. Correct. Yeah. And so that's what I've worked <laughs> this fall. That's what I've been working on. Yeah. Um, but this Neolithic masks is what I'm working on now. So mm -hmm. I'm not, it's not that I'm not following POTS because I was at the Met on Tuesday following some POTS because I will forever follow POTS <laughs> when people tell me they have them. Um, but I'm now thinking about another corpus of material and trying to figure out how these masks, many of which were sold in the marketplace, got there. And I feel like it's unan unanswerable in many ways um, because it's not big enough and there just aren't that many of them and so um, I'm going to track those and I'm going to do more ethnographies with people who've interacted with them yeah um, but my day job is as a professor teacher um, I also work uh, with Chad Hill and York Rowan of the University of Chicago on a project called Kites in Context which is about Neolithic hunting traps in the eastern desert of Jordan and so we oh have, I was recently reading articles about that oh I wonder it's if... so great so we have a three-year NSF and uh, this summer will be our second field season and we're um, documenting them using drones and we are excavating them to figure out if we can date and also get a better handle on how they were used and so yeah. I'll be in the field doing that that's is there anything that you would leave people with as sort of a if they wanted to read about this this murky topic, modern crises of archaeology. There's a lot of really good stuff out there right now, especially um, on the display of um, human remains mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. also like archaeological, the display of archaeological material from various regions. Um, I would definitely look at the work of people like Alice Stevenson and mm -hmm. Heba El Gawad on um, human remains in Egypt and colonialism. The work of Elizabeth Marlowe, she's done a ton on museums and provenance and really thoughtful pieces. And then people like Emmeline Smith and Donna Yates and Naomi Osterman, they're working on the movement of other materials in different mm -hmm. parts of the world, Central mm -hmm. and South America, dinosaurs, huge market for dinosaurs. Uh, um, yeah. thought about that. <laughs> oh, huge, <laughs> yeah. huge market, especially Mongolian stuff. Um, and then... 
Emmeline is working on materials from Southeast Asia, Nepal, and Cambodia, and places like that. So there's a lot of, um, it's, it's not a groundswell, there's just a lot of people working on this right now, more so than probably in the past, because this is a moment where we're really being more self-reflective in our, how we practice archeology, span how we be more ethical, how we collaborate better with our host countries and host um, individuals. And so there's just, a, there's a ton of work out there. I have a, a quote that I actually thought it might be kind of fun to kind of conclude things by, by a, sharing. A quote um, of mine or someone else's? Of, of someone else's okay, and good. to kind of hear what your thoughts were on it. Um, but yeah. what if it's someone I don't like? Are you going to edit that <laughs> I can, out, I can right? cut it out then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so it's from David Hurst Thomas. But the quote is, um, archaeology is not what you find, it's what you find out. To me, that seems like it applies to a lot of these issues very well. Yeah, I think um, that's pretty legit. Moving beyond treasure, I guess, I suppose. Well, again, it depends on how you define treasure. If you think <laughs> yeah, a single lentil yeah. is treasure, yeah. you're never going to move beyond that. But yeah. if you're looking for gold, yes, moving beyond. Well, on that note, thanks so much for taking the time to talk with me. This it was, was great. a pleasure. Thanks, Sebastian. This was super fun. And thank you for listening to this episode of The Tell. Until next time. Hey, everybody. If you enjoyed the podcast and you want to help me talk to more people in more places, please consider donating. You can do so on my Patreon as a recurring donor, as well as on my website if you'd rather do a one-time donation. The links are patreon.com slash Sebastian Weatherby and www.sebastianweatherby.com. Show notes are also available on my website, where you can find citations and comments and other relevant information about the things we talked about today. Thanks again for listening.